Tripp and Lene, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Great to be here. <laughs> Fantastic. So uh, I actually met you guys because you were interviewing me about Genetic Insights, and I was so blown away with how interesting what you guys are doing was and what a perfect fit it is for this podcast that focuses on all aspects of rejuvenation, and there's a lot that you guys do that's very interesting. I'm very uh, impressed, especially of you know, how scientific what you're doing is and that you even do a, a, you know, for one of your programs, you do a before and after test to prove that people have <laughs> biologically reversed their aging process. So that's awesome. So we'll get into all of that. Um, but before that, let's talk a little bit about your background, if I may. Uh, I know that, um, you know, you have a, uh, a medical background trip, but other than that, what led you guys to, you know, focusing on regenerative medicine? Yeah. So, uh, trips, well, education experiences in medical oncology and hematology, and he did that for over 30 years. Um, and then towards the end of that 30 years, at, when he was 50, we conceived his first child, and he figured he might want to figure out how to, you know, keep the pace. Do you want to want to delve into that? <laughs> right. So I I got very uh, became very interested in the uh, in the science of. Uh, of aging, so to speak, and, you know, things looking into optimization so that I could maintain my health as, uh, as long as possible, given the fact that uh, uh, our son, first eldest son, uh, we have a, a second son too, but uh, our eldest son uh, is uh, looming on 19 years old and was conceived on the eve of uh, my 50th birthday. So, so I'm, uh, so I'm, I'm, there and I'm thinking, well, you know, he's going to be 18 years old. I, I'm going to, I'm, I don't want to be rolling around in a wheelchair and have have issues, and uh, uh, that's all he remembers of me. And uh, so, one thing led to another, and I went and I uh, got involved in a number of uh, of academic uh, courses and things like that to to get this knowledge base and um, additionally uh, expand and started using it actually in my cancer patients at the. Uh, in the well, day. Go, be a little more specific. You were, you oh. delved into this information okay. personally for your personal use and mm -hmm. that looked like what? Like what did that look like? Like what did you learn? Well, so in in, in the day it was, uh, and still is, there's more information now obviously than then, but um, there they were talking about uh, the, the early concepts were to uh, optimize the, uh, and take the environment, the physiologic environment that existed and whoever, whoever it was that was over a certain age or who was having medical issues and wanted to feel better and younger and all of that, um, it kind of was the very initial beginnings of the growth hormone, uh, HGH and, and, and testosterone era that uh, preceded kind of everything. But that idea... And when was this? Was this, this like was, early 2000s? Uh, yeah, 2005, um, uh, six. Yeah. Yeah. 2005, six, and uh, I mean, there was still there was already a a, a fair amount of information out, but uh, as as I delved into that, and I obviously was using it on myself, and and uh, and actually started using it on some of my cancer patients with so, sometimes phenomenal results. I mean, the uh, ability, the sense of well being, uh, despite going through treatments for their cancers and things like that was. Uh, sometimes amazing, and their longevity during those uh, during those administrations in the prevention of disease recurrence seemed to be anecdotally um, seemed to be anecdotally better than than those of the patients who declined uh, declined or didn't just couldn't uh, participate in those treatments. And uh, and, not to and so, kind of clarify. Other than that, at that stage, you were still doing traditional cancer treatments, presumably like surgery and chemotherapy. I and so can I ask what kind of interventions it was? Because, you know, of the two you just mentioned, funnily, like growth hormone, a lot of people are worried these days to take it because they think it, like, increases the incidence of cancer and then testosterone, even some people are concerned about that. Like, so was it those two things that you found were improving it or was it other things? Well, there was, you didn't go into the mindset component. Well, and yeah, it, I mean, uh, uh, getting there, I think um, the, uh, the medical and physiologic optimization component was also combined with this uh, mind-body and uh, at that at that same moment. Interesting, right. So it wasn't just 
it wasn't specifically testosterone or HGH. It was looking at their nutritional, their, you know, could they do anything, physical fitness, looking at metabolics and optimization, those things, but also a significant pillar that he's about to talk about is we developed a mind-body coaching program so that really helped shift the patient's thought processes to support what their goals were. So it's we, we call it a four pillars approach and we started implementing it while he was still full-time in medical oncology. Right, I would have gotten there, but that was a succinct approach. <laughs> We'd still be sitting okay. here tomorrow. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, well, tell us, tell us, so tell us what that involves, sir, please. You know, this this four step approach, four pillar approach. So it's basic, basically the four pillar approach, and that results in that in that physiologic optimization. When I, I'm going to diverge just a little bit here. Um, I'm going to diverge just a little bit here and say the physiologic optimization when when we see a patient or when I see a patient I say uh, I say well let's say he, the patient is uh, in their mid fifties and they're they have multiple metabolic problems and this and that and the other and they're not feeling good they're dragging they're just not keeping up and they certainly are nowhere near what they used to be when they were in their twenties. I'll tell them basically what we're going to do is we're going to take that environment that that exists, that uh, potentially fairly toxic environment that exists in the body, and revert it back to the environment that uh, kind of existed with uh, when within their twenties or, or early twenties. So what that does, and I included the HGH, the testosterone, the nutrition, the exercise, uh, the mind body. Those are the the four pillars. But I guess the all of that, all of those combined together. So sorry, just so yeah. hormones, nutrition, so, exercise, so hormones, mind body. Optimization, mm -hmm. physio, yeah. physio, physical optimization, nutritional optimization, and mind body. So I think it's important also that while we are looking at those four pillars, they are bio individualized to the needs and the goals of the patient. So it's not a cookie cutter program it's specifically tailored to that person yeah and that's the bit that i am you know most interested in i think that's one of the keys to my work is it's you know bio individual identity and every person is unique and i really like that you guys are doing that so and you've been doing it for a long time so um like how do you um what, what methods do you use to ascertain, you know, what is and isn't appropriate for, for different people? Is, is it, are you doing blood work? Do you look at genetics? Like, what, what do you do to help people, uh, you know, work out what's right for them? Yeah, so we have a very comprehensive lab panel that is way more comprehensive than what somebody's going to get at their primary care doctor. And then we're looking for a very strict parameter of values that we're looking at because we know that normal, normal values in today's reactive medicine center isn't necessarily healthy. So we're looking for specific parameters. If the patient can afford it, then we prefer for them to get a biological age kit at the beginning when they get those labs so that we have a really good picture of where they're starting from. And then from that information, we tailor that information plus their goals. So, you know, when patients come to us, they're keen on what it is that they don't want. They haven't really conceptualized the happy end result, what that looks like, what that feels like, what they would be doing in that scenario that they're not doing now. So really spending that time with the patient to help them get clear on what their goals are. So you're taking the information from the history, you're taking the information from the labs, you're taking the information from the genetic testing, and you're taking what they are wanting the end result to be, and then plugging in, okay, well, this is the nutritional uh, path that's right for you. This is the physical fitness path that's right for you. These are the hormones that we're going to look at getting optimized. And all along that course, these we have a book it's called think and live longer that book is really our program for the mind body component so every patient is given that book and then they're held accountable for reading and understanding those chapters because that's what helps them shift their thinking process excellent yeah very interesting and it's funny that you know our systems have that in common that the last step 
is focused on the emotional psychological element right which is you know the belief element focusing on what it is that you actually want to achieve and believing that it's possible <laughs> so that's awesome that you guys incorporate that i don't think anywhere near enough people do um so sorry to go back to the testing thing i know we certainly can't cover all of it but we do have you know quite a sophisticated audience that you know understands a lot of this stuff so would you mind giving a few examples like okay so if we see this blood marker usually people are satisfied with this but we like to make you know the optimal range we think is this and therefore we would do this you know is there any kind of example like that you can give for us you could do a case study pick a patient well, i think i think the from a, a laboratory perspective i mean uh, most people are are probably familiar with the concept of zombie cells and welfare cells and uh, well I call them welfare cells because they uh, they're a growing population in the body over the course of time that contribute to the aging and to the, the deterioration of our overall health and well-being and as they the, may be but I'd love if I, I'd love if you expand and educate us on that so yeah tell us about that so there's normal cells welfare cells zombie cells tell us what that means please so so that so those are those cells are the toxic environment that develops in our body as we're not able to keep up with the damages of that after we're about 25 years old. Our our cells actually actually get damaged, and when they get damaged, some of them don't go ahead and die. They uh, go into this population of cells that no longer participates in the function of the body or the organ they they're supposed to be participating in. They just consume resources. So they're consuming resources. They're not participating. So they're they're taking the resources away from the the active cells and consuming them so the active cells are then then suffering more and toxic environment is again created inflammation is created use of the atp is multiplied many many fold and so what happens is that it, your body is eating up a lot of energy but not it's not producing a lot of gainful gainful activity or or useful outcome and that's how the symptoms eventually develop. And then uh, ultimately, reactive medicine intervenes when, when you get to that point where you're actually seeing end organ failure or, uh, or suffering. So take the kidney, for example. You know, once we get to, once we get to a, a creatinine clearance of um, 30, 20 to 30, we're retaining fluids. We're starting to need uh, Lasix and things like that, a diuretic to get the fluids off. And then once it gets down to 15 or, or below, uh, then the specter of the dialysis machine comes out or kidney transplant at that point. So, so it's a very progressive thing that happens. But when you optimize the environment, what happens is that you're giving these substrates, you're bringing back to that youthful level the, all of the substrates that, that are needed by the organs, uh, and even though the, the zombie cells or the welfare, welfare cells are still consuming, they're still adequate up substrates, so to speak, for the cellular, or the active and functional cellular environment. So immediately you have a uh, decline in, in the production of inflammation and, and therefore more uh, useful production of ATP. And those things... Sorry. Those, Oh, yeah. Let me stop you there. That was fantastic. Um, so is this the theory that's called cell senescence or the cell danger response? I, uh -huh. I've heard of this. Cells. Yeah. Okay. So, so let me ask you a little bit. About, so is your belief in this is the primary cause of aging, your belief and experience? Or is this just one of many factors you've picked out to talk about? And, you know, yeah, let's start with that. So I, I think that that, that uh, you know, they're the seven cellular causes of cellular aging and the and cell senescence in that and uh, a number of those factors are are accelerated simply by the fact of the absence of substrates and the and the uh, inability of the cell to access uh, the energy sources to maintain a healthy environment inside and so as uh, that and when you say substrate sorry could you tell us what that means well substrates the the nutrients uh, the nutrients and those things that actually uh, help the body make make its energy sources to go ahead and and assist in the reactions that are necessary, the biological reactions that are necessary. Okay, so whether it's carbon dioxide or pyruvate or NAD or any of these kind of things you're talking anything, about, anything, okay, all of them. anything like mm -hmm. that. Okay, okay. So a lack of all the nutrients or building blocks, as I would call them, 
um, means that then, uh, so, and sorry, yeah, to go back to what you were saying there. So you're saying that rather like trying to destroy the senescent cells, which I think some people talk about, you're less focused on that. You're more focused on just giving the person an abundance of substrate, um, like the building blocks so that then, uh, they're able to produce enough energy. Was that what you said? I just want to like go back and really understand it. And enhance those those reactions that actually uh, en enhance autophagy, for example, and and help clear out the environment within the cell that turns it into a zombie cell or a welfare cell. Those are the that's uh, the actual environment that we're working on by allowing all of these substrates to be back and getting them back into a, a more youthful environment. And when a reactive, for example, a reactive medical physician looks at looks at a thyroid, for example, this is a classic example. Thyroid, your, your TSH needs to be between 0.5 and, uh, and according to whatever laboratory you have and say 4.5. Well, let's say you're, let's say you're, um, you're 50 years old and your TSH is at 3.2. Well, that's within the normal range, right? It's in the bell curve, it's in the normal range. So a reactive medical physician says, oh, this is fine. But in fact, for a year old, because the thyroid has been subjected to, to, to damage and doesn't produce the thyroid, thyroid hormones quite as well as it used to, what's happening is that 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 level is not is no longer adequate. It's not like when you were 18 and you, you had a, um, a TSH maybe a 0.5. So as you as we as we confine the confine that range of normalcy that to an optimum range, a more youthful range, is then we actually add a little bit of substrate there to subsidize the, the functioning of the different organs that uh, primarily hormonal. And then in this case, it might be T T3 or T4 you're talking about as a substrate. As the additive. I mean, I've never seen uh, quite, uh, frankly, in my practice, I've never seen uh, some of the uh, thyro thyroid supplements that are supposed to enhance thyroid function. Sure. Of the organic things, I've never seen those work adequately, quite frankly. So so I'm yeah. talking about we're a big fan of T3 and T4 if necessary here as well don't worry so we're on the same page so so sorry just to go back um and so what percentage of these cells need to be senescent or welfare cells you say before it starts before maybe I guess it's more than zero percent but at what stage how, what percentage of these cells are this way before a person becomes suboptimal and at what stage generally, how much a percentage of these cells need to be this way before a person becomes seriously ill? Do you see like a, like a trend? And obviously it's case by case, but just like a rough guess average. <laughs> well, I would say that when you, you, you're getting rid of, uh, you're progressively compromising organ function, there, there is no over, we don't have any clear data on that actually, but at the same time, if you, if you, um, hypothesize that at 24, 25 years old, you, you're not entirely correcting things and you're starting, starting to develop that population. Um, and symptomatically, you're not developing, and maybe you're not slowing down until you're in your mid thirties, mid to late thirties. That period of time has allowed an accumulation of, uh, of the welfare cells and, uh, and has deteriorated the environment uh, to a certain degree, and then it just progresses on and on. You may not see a, an overt ab abnormal laboratory until you're, depending on how grievous the, the toxicity is in the system, until you're uh, 50 or 60 even maybe. So those things, the change in the creatinine clearance, a modification of, the, of your liver function enzymes, uh, those things, uh, if you're seeing those things, then there's already there's already a fair amount of damage in all likelihood. Right, and hormonal balance and insulin resistance and all of that, yeah. Okay, so we don't know exactly what percentage is. Science hasn't got that far yet. Um, what about testing? Are, are you testing cellular senescence itself? Do you have a laboratory test for that or are you just um, assuming it based on other markers? So, uh, so the... Um, until the advent of the, you know, the epigenetic, well, the, the further development of the biological clocks, uh, you know, the telomeric length, uh, uh, there are multiple biological clocks out there, but uh, the most useful uh, first came about with Horvath and his 
data on the uh, epigenetic aging and so and the the uh, single nuclear nucleotide polymorphisms and the number of them that were actually shutting down the DNA and at the advent of that test which was maybe what 10 years ago or so um, that has allowed at least uh, an assessment, a reliable linear assessment and correlation with the biological age of the individual. And at, at, at this juncture, not we don't know whether just acting on the cellular level is really many of these things, the supplements that are out there and all of these things that are being used, we don't really know that using a single supplement to speak of is, is going to result in a, you know, an improvement in longevity. We don't have that data because those are longevity, uh, those are long-term studies that haven't been done or maybe in the process of being done. But what we do know is that the amount of DNA that's functional is, is really, really where we can assess, well, if you've got, if you have a significant shutdown of uh, a certain percentage of your DNA, then uh, you're you're aging more rapidly relative to the population of people that have already been tested. So it's being compared with, with, blood, with blood and with uh, analyses that, uh, of a fairly large population. It's not, not a global population, obviously, but it's a fairly large population, and that population is growing depending on which, which uh, biological clock test they're, they're taking. Okay, and this is the biological test that you have everyone do as part of your uh, integrative bioindividualized plan, right? The the true age test, which is the DNA methylation test. Um, so I, I kind of thought that was the degree that the cell the cells have aged, uh, but I guess you're agreeing with that. But you're saying from that you can make an assumption as to how degraded overall the cells are in terms of how many of them have become senescent. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, kind of. Okay, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and, so, and so, all right. We use that test at the beginning. We get a baseline. As, and sometimes they're not bad, but sometimes, uh, you know, I've had patients with up to uh, 25, 30 years um, biological age advance on their tr on their chronological age uh, that as we as we implement the program for them uh, and those with a, a more rapid aging uh, or rapid uh, age on their versus their chronological age I, I tend to be more aggressive on the approach and and ask them to implement more things because these things are not covered by insurance obviously and that's a that's always a, somewhat of a hindrance but at the same time, uh, as we approach that, I've also had uh, 20 years, by almost 20 years of biological age reversal, and my average on about 180 patients now is is about 11 years. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I can say from my experience, it's not easy to shift. You asked me at the end of our interview uh, last time what mine was, and I think from what I remember, it was like a year uh, older than I actually am. Um, but I think it said the pace of aging was like 0.67 year. So uh, I guess that that's how much it estimates that you are currently aging every year. And so I figure that the fact that I was slightly older than my age meant all the bad health I had definitely had that I freely admit that I had, but the pace of aging was a good indicator that that is, you know, going to be reversed, fingers crossed. Um, but I'm still looking forward to getting that test result where it actually says that I have, you know, de-aged by 10 years. I haven't done it in a year and a half, so I should do it again. But I think it's fantastic that you do that with your clients and uh, it's uh, very interesting. So uh, thank you for that. We really got into the weeds, but I think that's really good. So to go back to, um, you know, the, the, the key things that I heard you mention there are like toxins and substrates, right? So Toxins being the things that are causing the aging or accelerating the aging, and then lack of substrates being the other thing that is causing the aging or accelerating the aging. Did I understand that correctly? Correct. Okay. And so and, which and, toxin... Sorry. So it may not be a specific toxin outside the body, but it, it, we, it depends on who we are, how we live, what our lifestyles are, uh, all of those things that, that cause an environment that is unhealthy so they they may not they may not directly cause point damage but the environment inside the body uh, or in a, in a region uh, say in an organ region then becomes say not as conducive to function 
and subsequently causes the damage, the cellular damage, that then if it's, if it's repaired when we're, as when we're younger, then it's not an issue, no harm, no foul. But as we get older and we have fewer stem cells and, and the environment is harder to, to repair, uh, uh, because of us using more and more ATP and having more and more inflammation in the body, those things are the things that have the greatest impact. And that continued toxic environment augments the augments the number of the welfare cells, the zombie cells, and uh, subsequently then the symptomatology. But just the inflammation by itself is, I mean, your body has to create the reaction and then it has to respond to it. So you're, you're burning the candle both ends. You're, you're, you're consuming your ATP, which is our energy source, our gasoline, so to speak. You're consuming the candle at both ends. And if, you, and if you're doing that, then those things where you need energy for, for extracurricular activities, let's say, then it becomes less and less and less. And so that's the symptom, the fatigue the you know the maybe the lack of focus those things like that those are the things that are telling us that it's not right in there anymore or on the other side can be anxiety and lack of ability to sleep and all that oh, kind of stuff right imbalance. some people go so the other way creator yeah. imbalance and that all results from that if you're if your end your end organs are being if you focus on the end organs being the endocrine organs then obviously uh, you testosterone, your estradiol, your progesterone, all of those are, are creating a neuromediator environment in the brain that's uh, either good and you're happy and moving along and getting along with your life, or if it's not, then then anxiety, depression, melancholy. Uh, I prefer melancholy to depression because I think it's used too much to, to give pills, but I think uh, in that setting, in that setting it's, it, it's those, those moods and emotions that tend to become more predominant. Genetic Insights provides cutting edge affordable DNA testing, giving you access to over 500 health reports that can help you in three key ways. They may be able to resolve your existing health challenges even when nothing else has worked. Using simple lifestyle changes, their reports can help you reduce your risk of developing future health challenges that you may be genetically predisposed to. And they can help you feel more confident in your health by showing you where you are genetically strong. Unlike most other genetic health testing companies, Genetic Insights tests over 83 million different variations in your genes, guaranteeing 99.7% accuracy across all of their DNA reports. They cover almost every aspect of health, including digestive issues, cardiovascular health, weight loss, hormonal and blood sugar balance, as well as nutrient needs, allergies and intolerances, and so much more. Using their system is quick and easy, and reading the reports is simple. If you've done an Ancestry DNA test, you can simply download your raw DNA data, upload it to the Genetic Insights platform, and within a few hours, you will have access to genetic reports which give you a risk score for each specific issue and scientifically validated recommendations based on your individual genetic profile. Everything in your reports are based on scientific studies and there are citation links throughout every report. If you are serious about optimizing your health and wellness and feeling great, then getting access to your Genetic Insights reports may be the most important health investment you will ever make. In the reports, not only will you gain insights into how to overcome existing health challenges and avoid future issues, you'll also discover which types of dietary, lifestyle, and even supplement protocols are best for your unique genetics. To get your unique genetic health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and use code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. That's geneticinsights.co using coupon code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. So let's focus on toxins now. Um, do you, uh, you said toxins are so key, so let's understand a little bit more. Let's try and be specific, if I may. Um, I know that you customize everything, and so you know every person is different, all the rest of it, but do you look at individual toxins or do you look at classes of toxins like heavy metals, mycotoxins, whatever, or do you focus more on the signs of toxins having been there or being there like elevated liver enzymes and other metabolites or, you know, lipid peroxides or whatever, like how, how do you evaluate toxicity in someone? 
So uh, the initial panel does the vast majority of that, and we do look for heavy metals and a number of a number of specific toxins. But it's the it's the function, it's the end organ function that we're more I'm more interested in in the moment because as as you move most people into a healthy lifestyle and you modify their their thought process to su such that they're they're trying to create that that or reach the metric that they that we've created together for the optimization process so their their thought process is going to change actually change uh, the exposures that they're having over the course of the years to come so exposure and also behavior right so a lot because because they're less likely to poison themselves with things, do you mean, or? Well, I mean, not, I mean, not just like literal drinking poison, but if you're eating processed food, you are creating a toxic environment in your body. If you're laying on the couch all day, you are creating a toxic environment in your body. So, you know, your lifestyle behavior contributes, what is it, 80 to 90% of, wow. of your health. So just those simple tweaks and modifications and behavior can help you reverse your age. You don't have to go, you know, do anything extreme or become Brian Johnson in order to reverse your age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it could be things like noticing that, you know, the fragrances in your laundry detergent or your cleaning materials are actually toxic and not using them. And all of that comes with awareness and, and being pointed in the right direction, right? So, yeah, yeah, that definitely makes sense. Great word awareness. Yeah, yeah. So that definitely makes sense. Okay, that's fantastic. And then in terms of substrates, let's just clarify that a little bit more for people before we finally move on to your, um, you know, overarching approach, which I am looking forward to. Um, so what kind of substrates are that you see that when they're low create the most problems? You mentioned thyroid as one example. That's a good one. I like to talk about that one a lot as well. Uh, you, you know, you mentioned nutrition. Like, is it low magnesium? Is it this, is it that? And I know that every case is different, every person's different, but what are like some of the commonalities that you see, you know, like frequently that are often... Well, everybody, everybody's vitamin D deficient, wouldn't you say? Right. And most people are hypothyroid. And iodine. I, I would say 30% of my practice is iodine deficient. So, well, they were. They were seeing you. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're talking about the point of intake here. Yeah. That's so interesting with iodine. Let me ask you about that because my understanding is there isn't really, uh, a, please correct me, that there isn't a test that's like very definitive for iodine. Uh, so what, what, how do you assess that? So, so doing the doing a serum iodine is is uh, so I've been doing it so long now that if I get if I re receive a result that's even a, a little bit on the low side of normal, um, I've done so many confirmatory twenty four hour urine collections that I generally correlate that with uh, with uh, iodine deficiency very easily without having to do that test. But at the same time. Um, the the real challenge is the number of halogens, the other the other uh, of the same uh, chemical group are in the are, that are in our atmosphere that are placed there in in an effort to make our lives better, but in actuality uh, compromise uh, our body's ability to to maintain a good iodine level. Uh, fluoride is so the this is, so this is chlorine, chlorine, bromide, fluoride, 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 chloride. Uh, bromide, iodine, and there's, uh, uh, there's one more. Okay. So bromide, you get in bread and all kinds of things. Chlorine's in the water. Fluoride, you know, sometimes oh, yeah. in the water. Uh, many, What's many, the one, sorry? many municipalities here in the United States actually use, add some fluoride to the, uh, to the water supply uh, ostensibly to, to have improved dental health. And what that does it di displaces it displaces the iodine, which is a much larger atom, uh, and it makes it hard for the for the iodine to get back into those places that are necessary. And there's already very good uh, clinical studies and histological confirmation that, for example, uh, women with uh, women who are iodine deficient uh, develop uh, fibrocystic disease and dysplastic changes in their breasts. Uh, iodine is very important for our glandular health, and uh, that is a um, really important perspective to keep in mind. So, yeah, these things are, 
as we as we optimize all of that and get that back into the body, I've had actually had patients, for example, female patients uh, with uh, fibrocystic disease respond to iodine replacement therapy. Amazing stuff. Hmm. It's funny with iodine because um, you know I I used to take it because I'd heard similar things about how beneficial it is, and a lot of time after I took it, I felt kind of cold. And, you know, some people said it's a detox reaction. And then eventually, you know, I developed hypothyroidism and I came across the work of a doctor who claimed that iodine excess is actually more common these days and that often iodine excess causes hypothyroidism. And he claimed to be curing people just by restricting the iodine uh, in their diet and claiming the hypothyroidism went away. And I must say, I still have, I still have well over the RDA of iron because it's naturally in the foods that I eat. But since I've stop supplementing it, I've been doing better. Um, so, but I guess that, again, that could be a biochemical individuality thing, right? Some people have too much, some people have too little, and you just got to find what's right for them. Right, it's a, a genomic, maybe a genomic, uh, probably a genomic issue. Yes, yeah, so just say, iodine, you don't definitely need iodine if you're listening, but you may well need it, and if you need it, it's gonna change your life. It's one of those things, like so many things. Um, okay, so you mentioned thyroid, you mentioned vitamin D3, that's interesting. Um, anything else that you put like as a very, you know, commonly, um, you know, helpful substrate? So our society being what it is, um, uh, and uh, is very stressful. And I think the... I mean, the society is stressed out. <laughs> yeah, we're, all society, out. we're all stressed out. We're all stressed out. Bills reason, come every other. month, so of course we're stressed out. <laughs> And, and so uh, I find a lot of deficiency in, uh, in some of the precursor, precursor uh, adrenal hormones. So uh, pregnenolone, DHEA, uh, those are other hormones for virtually every other steroid hormone that we have, including cortisol. And uh, I find that uh, in replacing those, um, the, the symptoms of adrenal fatigue, which has not really been, you know, uh, uh, accepted as a diagnosis, but uh, the symptoms of fatigue and energy loss during the course of the day, energy at the beginning of the day, um, ability to sleep well and those things, uh, those things get significantly better uh, when, uh, when your DHEA levels are and your pregnenolone levels are in uh, a higher, higher zone. Interesting. And, and what about the sex hormones? While we're talking about hormones, uh, like how many men do you find, you know, benefit with testosterone? How many women do you find benefit with progesterone and maybe other things? Is that pretty common as well beyond a certain age? Or do you prefer to use the precursors like pregnenolone and DHEA? Yeah, the, unfortunately, the system, again, being as we get older, it's damaged, it's, even if it has a substrate, uh, it generally doesn't uh, amount in production. Uh, of adequate amounts, and if we look at, if we take some inferential information from the large, for example, the large cholesterol trials, uh, you, there have been many secondary afterlooks on the on the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people that have done those trials, and and we find what do we find? We find actually that um, that uh, that. These hormone levels, particularly, uh, we're calling a, a one on testosterone. It's separated in quintiles. The mortality increases by declining quintiles. So, from one hundred to to eighty percent is better. Life longevity and morbidity is better than eighty to sixty, sixty to forty, and so on and so forth. So, uh, maintaining those optimized testosterone levels, and I'm not talking about uh, androgen level, uh, you know, hyper usage I'm, that uh, very often the, the bodybuilders will do or the anabolics that they use, those are quite harmful. In fact, I'm talking about maintaining uh, optimized, optimized levels in those 80 to 100 percentile levels. Those levels maintain uh, an amazing amount of, uh, of uh, focus and memory and prevention of dementia. These these studies are all out there. Uh, there's correlation with the Alzheimer's protein that goes up as testosterone goes down. All of these things are out there already and been out there for decades. It's it, and are not being used. And as we as we take the perspective that well, if when we're you know 20 years old our testosterone is in the 900s, and you know in our 
you know, mid thirties to forties were in, in our four hundreds to six hundreds, um, f- for whatever reason, then that climbs then our risk for cardiovascular disease and, and, um, dementia and, um, bone disorders and that are, and musculoskeletal demise is, are increased significantly. So maintaining those at these upper optimum levels is very helpful. So the the answer to your question is yes, most people have suboptimal levels in those areas. Even women have suboptimal. Oh, let me talk range. about it. And you like to get them to and you like to get them to the top of the reference range is what I heard there, which is you right. know interesting. I mean, and presumably this were when they were in their prime, so in your 20s, you can get those levels back to that level. And in my clinical And the prime, same with progesterone. Sorry, and the same with progesterone for women? Oh, yes, absolutely. You can't, you should never use a sub, uh, replacement and optimization of estradiol without optimization of progesterone. You, you actually do have a small trend in increased breast cancer. And, um, so you need balance. The balance needs to be there. So um, estradiol is a, is a stimulant. It's a stimulating, cellular stimulant. So if you're always stimulating and you don't have a balance, which the progesterone prov- provides, you end up with a, a, a little bit of an increase in uh, your risk for breast cancer. So you must have that as, as a balance. And I, I think um, the number of disease processes prevented by um, postmenopausal and perimenopausal, uh, um, I routinely am optimizing those perimenopausal uh, hormone levels for women and it it makes a huge difference in sense of well-being and quality of life and overall um, and there are numerous studies on on their outcomes so yeah it's fantastic and you mentioned growth hormone earlier let's talk about that um, do you still use actual growth hormone or do you prefer growth hormone peptides or something else mk177 like what, what do you like uh, 677 what do you like in regard to growth hormone these days as as we you know all of these hormones all of our metabolics are inter uh, interlinked they they all act on one another and so we know that we know that for example the um, uh, DHEA levels uh, the testosterone levels uh, all of these things interact to augment uh, actually uh, our growth hormone levels and our um, and. Uh, and in my practice, what I tend to do, there are some secretagogues that actually have good cl- clinical trial work. The first thing I will try to get them back into optimum ranges, uh, if they're at the low, low levels uh, of normal, uh, will be secretagogues, uh, sublingual secretagogues. Uh, ultimately, if those are not successful, then... And, and sorry, what, what would that be, sublingual? I don't think I've heard of that. Is it... Yeah, sorry, I mean... Is it MK677 or what is a sublingual growth hormone secretagog? That would be fine, uh, but um, uh, I think the uh, there are a couple of products out there, uh, secretropin being one of them, uh, that you squirt under the tongue before you go to bed at night and it, it, it boosts that production of growth hormone. Um, and that's had good clinical trial work. Uh, there are a number of these things that uh, actually are touted as uh, the, the peptides I generally save until a second, the second level of approach because uh, I think uh, the expense and um, uh, there is a lack of, of good clinical trial work in a number of them. But having them available and they've been successful in some cases, some cases they've not been successful. Um, so and then after that you go directly to the, uh, directly to the uh, recombinant. Uh, but it's so expensive there are a few people that want to do that. Yes, yeah, at least a thousand dollars a month, right? We're talking a lot of money just for that. Yeah, at least. Yeah. Um, okay. And the fact, I think, the fact that you were an oncologist uh, is very interesting because, of course, I think the biggest hmm, uh, objection or fear around growth hormone of any type these days is people believe that it's going to, you know, increase uh, the risk of that. Yeah, what's your opinion on that? Because obviously, you have actual clinical experience of it. Yeah, I think there's there's no hard good clinical trial work that says uh, using supplemental stimulants uh, to produce endogenous uh, endogenous uh, growth hormone causes any increased risk of cancer. Uh, mm. Okay, so that's with any any secretagogues or anything. And what about using you know, growth hormone itself, like literally injecting it? Do you feel like it's hundred percent safe as well? 
there the only the only real um, nefarious uh, uh, effect of growth hormone is when it's first started. It can create uh, on individual individual injections an increase in resistance, insulin resistance. Uh, so it might make people who are borderline diabetics or um, I don't say pre-diabetic because you either have it or you don't. Everybody's pre-diabetic <laughs> unless they're diabetic. Yeah, but, good point. <laughs> uh, but long-term use, long-term use uh, of a stimulants and growth hormone has actually been shown to reduce the uh, the risk of uh, diabetes and actually uh, improves insulin sensitivity. So. Um, I Very interesting. Uh, uh, what about? I think. Uh, uh, does it raise prolactin? Is that something you're concerned about? Um, only in the event of amenorrhea and uh, and uh, problems with uh, female uh, fertility, uh, and it's I don't run across it all that often. I think I have maybe one or two patients in the practice that have uh, excessive prolactin levels. Interesting. Okay. Well, there we go. So that's good to hear it from someone who's a doctor who's got plenty of experience actually administering it. Because uh, I get these kind of questions a lot about peptides, especially. Um, so that's very interesting. Um, and, and lastly, uh, it just in terms of nutrition, I think the only nutrient you've mentioned so far is vitamin D3 and iodine. And vitamin D3 is technically a, a hormone, according to some people. So um, are there any other nutrients that you notice that, you know, that there's common deficiency of that, or that maybe even there's not a deficiency, but nonetheless, when people have more, it, you know, it really helps their reverse their aging? Well, I think there's some small clinical trials out there now uh, using combinations of uh, DHEA um, growth Do you mean hormone. DHA? DHEA. 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 Okay, but that's a hormone. I was, I was saying more nutrients. Yeah. He's asking about nutrients specifically. Oh, that's right. I think it's classified as a nutrient here. It goes back and forth depending on the FDA. Okay. Uh, well, let me, let me, let me, when I say nutrients, I mean vitamins, uh, minerals, amino acids, uh, you know, essential fats, anything like that. Vitamin K. Right. Uh, I don't routinely check for deficiencies. I do, however, maintain that uh, patients should have vitamin K with their, um, with their vitamin D simply because it helps reorganize and redirect the, um, the, deposition of calcium in the bones rather than the arteries. Uh, so uh, we, we like to see that in the bone. Um, I, don't, I don't recommend routine calcium, uh, routine calcium uh, supplementation simply because of that same fact, because people, if they're just taking tons of calcium, uh, it doesn't necessarily go to the bone. And we've got, uh, unless you're severely osteoporotic, then uh, you have plenty of calcium in the bones there to use. So uh, I don't routinely uh, recommend that. Um, uh, and virtually all of my female patients that are postmenopausal have normal bone densities. Uh, and very often they come to me with osteopenia or osteoporosis. So yeah, I think uh, vitamin K is a, a, an important additive. Um, um, I wish I had interrupted you about the diet. Sorry, I wish I hadn't interrupted you about the DHEA because, yeah, I'm getting that, you know, the focus is more hormones, really, um, and obviously a healthy diet and stuff like that as well. But, you know, in terms of lots of rather lots of nutritional supplementation. And I respect that. And I think, you know, that makes a lot of sense because, of course, you know, uh, hormones will profoundly affect how your body utilizes or excretes or whatever, you know, rates of different nutrients, right? Like, uh, for instance, if you get your adrenals, and I think one of the reasons why magnesium deficiency is so common, as an example, is because, you know, people have adrenal and thyroid issues. But once those two are optimized, then generally there's not a lot of magnesium wasting, and then you know, the magnesium supplementation is not as necessary. So, you know, I, I do respect that approach of focusing more on hormones. And you, you bring up the magnesium. Magnesium has clearly been shown to be uh, to be a useful supplement. Uh, I think uh, I think that is it's, it helps cardio, cardiac regularity. It actually gives us a sense of calmness and uh, helps a number of systems work much more effectively. So uh, I guess uh, focusing on every single one of them would be uh, I think beyond the scope of. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, talk. yeah. No, it's just interested. Uh, yeah, and I'm glad you brought up K2 Linae. That's one of my favorites to mention every time people bring up uh, anti-aging as well. I 100% agree with that. Okay, well, fantastic. Um, so let's talk about 
uh, how many of your pillars have we covered so far, right? We've... <laughs> um, uh, what, sorry, so none of them? Well, we've, <laughs> we've covered the four pillars. We could delve into uh, regenerative approaches. Um, I don't think we've talked about that. We've talked about exercise very much, but that's obviously a, a key a key component also. Mm. Um, yeah, let's talk about that a little bit then. So what, what's your preferred yeah. recommendation? The um, anaerobic versus aerobic, and then you should talk about the healthy um, body fat for men versus and women. Well, as a physician, yeah, I have oh, my own kind of approach, I think, but uh, at the same time, I like, uh, because maybe and in this area of the country, in Louisiana, we see a, a huge amount of obesity and, uh, and that. So I, I like to... I like to try and get my patients into a, the best body composition they can get into, and there are you know, there are optimums for that. Eighteen uh, percent total body fat for females and fifteen uh, percent for males. Uh, but get a lot of resistance on the on that. <laughs> oddly enough, yeah, it's more a, cos <laughs> a cosmetic challenge for uh, many people as their their friends will start telling them as they they're really getting um, getting down and getting healthy and feeling great. Uh, your friends will start telling them, you look, you know, you look too thin. You look like you got cancer or something of that nature. And, uh, uh, so it's they call that crab in the bucket syndrome, don't they? Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so the but the I, I like the going the cardio route in the beginning uh, because it tends to trim uh, better and doing high intensity intervals. Uh, I like that and then. As they approach, as they get closer to their um, ideal body composition, say in the for women in the low 20 percentile range, uh, men maybe in the 20 percentile range, um, then I'll, I'll actually transition and and uh, help them build uh, build muscle and and that. Uh, in in more elderly patients, it, obviously it's important not to to aggravate the sarcopenia of aging. Um, and uh, by by virtue of uh, supplementation of and optimization of the growth hormone and uh, testosterone and the other the hormones and uh, metabolics, basically that staves off that loss and basically gets them ready to to build. And that's kind of the approach I use. I think uh, a minimum of thirty minutes a day of uh, of cardio. Uh, I like to see an hour a day, six days a week. I'm pretty, pretty hard on that, but, <laughs> but at the same time, uh, the, when people participate and they're focused on that, uh, that goal, it's, uh, it happens very quickly, uh, without the need for usage of, um, you know, the, the new peptide, uh, weight loss, um, weight loss, uh, supplementations there, the Ozempic and the Terzopeptide and that. Um, yeah, I, I so you say without those, I'm not a fan of those. I, are you saying you're also not a fan, or you try and avoid it? I say you don't need them. You don't need them when you optimize that environment environment inside. <laughs> when you optimize that environment inside, and you're compliant, and and you're change, you're actually changing your intake to optimize uh, the um, the the macros that you you really need. And getting rid of the ones glucose, any of the the uh, carbohydrates, and minimizing the carbohydrates. I think one of the one of the things I tell every single patient when they're in, there's only one organ in our body that uh, uses carbohydrates as its primary source of energy. That's our brain, and even the brain can eventually accommodate to free fatty acids. So, so as we're as, if we know that, and we know that the brain only uses 20 to 30 net grams of carbohydrate a day and that our liver contains two to three weeks of reserve plus our muscles uh, you know we don't need to be cramming down the the carbohydrates and getting a lot of sugar in there and sugar is inflammatory um, as soon as it gets into the cell uh, and there's no place for it to go it starts sticking on the proteins inside the cell and causes difficulty of the conformational changes of those proteins and enzymes and doesn't allow them to do their work thereby causing error, thereby causing inflammation, thereby increasing the toxic environment and consuming ATP. Uh, so it's a, it's a vicious circle that, that, that once patients understand that and they understand that, uh, that consuming lesser amounts of, uh, of carbohydrate and the other main toxin is salt, 
uh, we can we can actually I see people melt and and have incredible results just by just by optimizing their their lifestyles and their nutrition and doing a little exercise those those they're simple and they're simple and they don't cost anything and they're not a burden on our uh, medical society and our, our and, or our pocketbook really. of course they also don't make money for uh, pharma, pharma. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. Makes yeah, I'm very interested. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting in relation to that, and you, you're already implementing this, even if you don't necessarily agree with me, is, you know, with, with uh, semaglutide or any of these other analogs, what they're doing is they're slowing the digestive system, thereby reducing appetite, they're all, thereby also potentially incre you know, increasing the chance of a whole host of problems when you slow down the digestive system. But if you eat less, you're also slowing down your metabolism which then means that your body is also burning less fuel. So it seems to be going the wrong direction. Whereas what you guys are doing, if you're increasing, you know, you're optimizing the level of thyroid and the level of progesterone and all these kind of things, that's going to be increasing the metabolism so that your body burns more fuel. I mean, I know I'm in a position now, um, I, I'm six foot three, I, I have 4,000 calories a day. I'm not even that physically active because I have to sit a lot. I don't put on any weight um, and it's not digestive problems anymore. I've checked that and all of that's very good. It's just, you know, my body's using it and but that's, you know, it's always 98.6 or higher, right? And, and so I feel really bad for these people who are slowing down their metabolism by eating less, creating all kinds of other problems. And, and it also means if they ever stop and go back to eating a normal amount of calories or even an excessive amount of calories because they feel like they've been missing out for so long, they're just going to pile on the weight, you know? Uh, you know, my wife had the same experience. We, you know, we've optimized her thyroid. She can pretty much eat as much as she wants, whenever she wants. She doesn't put on any weight. And I'm like, so you can either, you know, inject yourself with this poison once a week that literally makes you feel poisoned in many cases. Slow down your whole digestive tract. Slow down your metabolism. Reduce the amount of mitochondrial energy available. Um, you know, or you can actually increase your metabolism to the point you can eat wherever you want and not put on any weight. I mean, what, what's what's the better approach? Which is a norm, more physiologic approach, I mean, actually. Right, I mean, but one of those requires somebody to invest in themselves, invest and do the work. Well, and seek and out I, the appropriate medical assistance. I mean, yeah. uh, and the information is just not out there, unfortunately. I think we're, you know, we're on the, the bleeding edge here as, as well, the last 10 years has been very creeping up and more and more people, I think, are starting to get the... Uh, get the information and with these uh, the nutritional uh, uh, nutritional habits of uh, like keto and um, the low carb approaches and intermittent uh, fasting intermittent fasting those things that actually stimulate um, the anti aging process or stimulate those pathways that help us age uh, slower and better. I think it's starting. There is momentum, and I'm hopeful that over the course of the the rest of my career that I'll be seeing uh, a significant uh, increase in the number of people who are actually getting to the root of their problem is, is in lieu of taking a, a medication to camouflage those outcomes. Fair enough. And I'm sure people are, I don't know, skeptical watching this. They're saying, well, you're giving people other medication, right? You're giving them growth hormone and thyroid and stuff like that potentially. But you know, that's what I'm trying to, th those are things that your body already naturally creates that optimize functioning, whether it's, you know, a semaglutide or whatever is not, it's something that is interfering with your body's optional functioning, you know, at, at best. So I just wanted to draw that distinction for people. Uh, Alan, I'd, like to um, bring up a, uh, I'd love to talk a little bit. Just one more point about just cholesterol. Let's just take cholesterol as an example. When we do the optimization program, I, the first visit, I will stop anybody that's on a statin or cholesterol medication. I'll stop them. And I'll say, just go ahead and stop, and we're going to see what happens. And I can tell you that the cholesterol profiles of my patients that have been on three to six months of optimization, all their cholesterols are great. I believe it. Just optimizing thyroid usually gets it, you know, in the reference right, range, right? And it's really very, yeah. very simple if you know what you're doing, like you guys do. It's awesome. Well, uh, I just wanted to touch a tiny bit more on the... Uh, the last pillar of, so this is, again, this is a program that you guys offer. Let's just talk about this for a second. Um, uh, you know, it, it, 
Well, actually, no. Let's let's talk about this last bit a little bit more. Then we'll talk about exactly how people can sign up for this. What different things you offer in this regard. Um, so the mind body coaching part of it, I think, is very interesting. Uh, I like the way that you've integrated it. Um, I think that often is what's missing. I think as fantastic as everything that you guys are offering is, and I'm, you know, I agree with a lot of it, and think it's, you know, exactly the right approach. And uh, it's funny. I think if I if I listed the places I learned it from, and we listed the places this you learned it from, there probably wouldn't be much overlap. And that's a good thing, right? It just means, <laughs> you know, all these different sources are working out what works because what works is what works. So you know, it's great. Um, but one of the things that can hold people back is their belief, right? If they do not believe it's going to work, if they believe, oh, you know, uh, my my both my parents are overweight, I'm always going to be overweight, or you know, but you know, my dad dropped dead of heart disease at the age of fifty, I, you know, it's going to happen to me too. I think all of those kind of things uh, really get in the way, and that's partly why I like doing what I do with the genetics. Um, so I think what you guys do where you incorporate that aspect is very interesting. Could you just give, and I know you have a whole book on this as well, right? So even who, people who can't afford to uh, maybe do your full program, which of course would be ideal in every case, um, they can at least uh, also get some support from you guys on that. So yeah, could you tell us a little bit about the book and that part of the program and, and uh, I guess explain it in a nutshell as much as possible? Well. Can you explain it in a nutshell? In a nutshell? <laughs> you know I can't do that. <laughs> yeah, well, like... The very you can spend as long as you want. We don't really have a time limit on this podcast, but it's it's your own choice as to how long you want to spend on it. <laughs> yeah, well, like the very first meeting, the very first consult with a patient, like I said earlier, a lot of them come in very acutely aware of what it is they don't want, but they haven't conceptualized what it is they do want. And so that first chapter has an ec a very practical exercise in it where they are sitting down to really conceptualize, visualize, and really step into that feeling and emotion of what the healthiest, happiest version of them would look like. So anybody can take that exercise wherever they are and start that. And so when they come back for like their lab review and really getting into the program design for them, will look at, you know, and he will critique, to critique, what they want their, we call it the successful health image looks like. Um, and so once that's narrowed down, then that book takes them into what we call universal laws. So teaching them that, you know, if they want this outcome, for example, the fact that they want it the fact that they even desire it means that it is already available for them. That that version of them already exists by virtue of the fact that they want it. Quantum entanglement. Quantum entanglement. Um, so that's another you know chapter. So you get into that, and then you talk about the law of um, that's the law of supply. There's the law of sacrifice. Is it still sacrifice? Well, just for again, I think, but. Uh, well, so what Ellen go was talking about chapters. is uh, at the very beginning the belief thing the you know that's the law of success. The law of success says that you know you you have to conceive you have to conceive the endpoint in conceive believe you have to believe you can do it and then you achieve and that's success that's the law of success. So right at the very beginning, uh, people have to understand that as long as they believe they can do it then they're going to be successful. It's going to be theirs. And that, uh, as Lene was mentioning, the law of, that's the law of supply. law of supply says uh, as long as you have the desire in your heart and it, it, it's come to you, then it's already yours. And that's supported by all, all branches of spirituality and you know, physics, uh, both mechanical and, um, and quantum. So I think the, it's, a, it's an amazing thing that as we use those, as you use those universal laws and you apply them to your medical outcome and your desired outcome, what happens is, yeah, there are, there are things, yeah, you may have to make a sacrifice, but that sacrifice is probably something that's not serving you and is going to be replaced by something that's serving you and helping you achieve. Um, those, all of those things are are in that book and it goes by and gives examples and gives patient examples and practical uh, exercises and exercises to to help uh, to help reorient the thinking so that it, as you get that those short concepts of those universal laws in regards to health 
and your your anticipated or desired health outcome, then they actually help you use that metric of the goal and get closer and closer and closer to that goal and achieve it. So what uh, what we saw is these these laws, if you will, they had been used for decades in business and sales. Zig Ziglar used them, Brian Tracy used them. So they had been used a long time and highly promoted in business and the sales arena. Nobody was taking that same concept and applying it into creating your ideal health arena. And so that's basically what we've done is we've taken these things that are very familiar in this industry and move them. And what we see, what we've seen is we get good results from patients that are like, I'm not going to read the book. You're a quack, whatever. I'll, I only want to do the hormones. I only want to do the diet, right? We still get good results from those people, but we get life changing, relationship changing, income expounding, not to mention amazing health transformation when they take that, the mind body coaching program and they apply it. It doesn't just transform their health, but it transforms all these other aspects of their lives. And that's really what's exciting for us. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, you kind of almost preempted my question there, which was going to be, um, do you see a difference between people who do and don't like, no, not do you see, of course you do. Sorry. Like if you had to guess what percentage of difference do you see you know so do people get double the results if they apply it or not is it 50 percent more is it a thousand percent more like how much more effective is it when they implement uh, this part of it versus when they don't i mean i think you go from a good result of like maybe 60 percent to 120 percent i mean like literally have had a patient come to us and say that before he found us he had a gun in his mouth he was divorced, his children wouldn't talk to him, he was on disability, like he didn't see a way out of life. Took the book, also took the health components, but took the book and now has new relationships, has relationships with his children and is an employer. So became a business owner, like completely changed, not just his health, but every aspect of his life. So, you know, from a percentage perspective, I mean, people like that, they just blow it out of the water. It's amazing. I guess, that, and it's that's a, such a great question because from a, from a statistical point of view, I, I've never sat down to look at the, uh, if there were, uh, there's an objective marker that could be measured like that and, and assessed, but that would be a, that would be a wonderful well, thing to do. I right? know from, from us as the providers working with people that want to do as little as possible and don't really buy into the mind-body component, those are not as exciting or, um, you know, the energy isn't going both ways in that relationship and isn't as fulfilling from a provider perspective as it is when we have patients who love it and who really get into it and who not just read it but understand it and do the exercises and then come in and talking about it and how how it's changing you know their relationship with their mate or their kids I mean that's that's what really fulfills the from the provider perspective I don't think a lot of patients think about a provider perspective but it's a give and take energy situation you have to be in it. The only thing I think to help them is uh, to understand it is like, you know, when you've been excited about that thing that's helped you and you try to share it with someone else and often they like, like, that's how, that's how it is for us all day, every day. It's, right, that's, right, right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so that, that helps with it a little bit, but yeah, that's very interesting. And yeah, I'm sure it's true. Yeah. I wonder, you know, if you ever did that experiment, I suppose you wouldn't want to withhold it for everyone, but maybe trip, um, you could do, you know, you could track the before and after with the biological aging with the true age tests for people who do everything else, but not that component and, and see what the difference is. And I think you're probably right, Lene. I think, I think it probably would be, you know, 100% or 50%. You know, I reckon it probably would double the results. Yeah. Yeah. That's that would be idea. my guess. Yeah. And, <laughs> and that's, you know, I make it step seven of my system, but it's not because it's the mo least important you know, I make it the last step in my system because I think people who are interested in health, it's usually 
the last thing they want to hear about. So, you know, usually they want to talk about nutrition and, you know, herbs and all that kind of thing. And, but, uh, you know, uh, so I realized that for many people, it's a last resort, like to have to, you know, examine their beliefs and change them and reorient them and all the rest of it. So I think the fact that you guys are doing kind of forcing it onto people from day one as much as they're willing to. Yeah, in 10 years, I've only had two people be like, can I do your program and not do that? And I'm like, no, no. This is our practice Bible. This is who we are. This is what we're about. We know what happens when people read this. So if you don't want to do that, we're not going to be a good fit. Fair enough. And, you know, everyone has the right, of course, to have a criteria for who they do and don't, don't on board. And, you know, that makes perfect sense. So, yeah, I think it's great that you make it a condition and you're so passionate about it. It's awesome. All right. I know our time is li- limited. So that's the program. So the book is called. People want to look that up. Think yeah. and Live Longer. So if you go to Amazon, Think and Live Longer and type in Goolsby, you should it should pull up. Excellent. And that program that we just spent the last hour or so talking about is available on the website, uh, yourinfinitehealth.com. Uh, I think you talk about it on the homepage. Um, and there's testimonials and all kinds of, you know, in- video testimonials and all kinds of interesting stuff on there. That you were on, that you're on L1. So, and that's called Your Infinite Health Podcast. Your, Your Infinite Health Podcast, which is really awesome as well. Uh, but we're not finishing. Let's just talk a little bit about the other thing that you guys are really passionate about, which is also very interesting to me, and which I have less understanding of. I have quite a lot of understanding of what we talked about, obviously, which has been fun for me. But let's talk about regenerative medicine. So please tell us more about that. What does that mean, and what do you guys do? Wow. So uh, so early on, uh, when we started the uh, optimization thing, and uh, we were kind of breaking it out clinically uh, into a practice on its own, I, I actually, <laughs> it was just by happenstance, um, my sister lives in, in Florida, and I, I was going to go visit her, and I said, I saw this conference for, uh, for a musculoskeletal uh, technique that I thought would be very useful for my arthritic patients and that, that uh, claimed to, to be a, um, uh, not a panacea, but uh, near that, um, and help regenerating knees and hips and this and that and the other without people having to go to surgery. So I, I, I registered for that, went and visited my sister, and um, and uh, during that, I was exposed to a very, and this was 15, uh, 15 years ago or so, and uh, so I was exposed, kind of, uh, it wasn't at the very, you know, foundation, but very early on. And in my mind, um, my mind, I just, I just ran with it, so to speak, and uh, could see just huge potential, not only with that, the, the administration technique called prolotherapy, but the, uh, but the use of, uh, the future use of the biologics that, uh, that were being developed or that we have naturally in our bodies. And I think that was also part of the philosophy of the practice was being able to use the body's machinery, so to speak, because it's a fascinating thing that is amazing and can do so much and use that, stimulate that to do the repair as opposed to trying to give a pharmaceutical or whatever. And uh, so I went to that. So sorry, and, uh, sorry, yeah. just to write, so prolotherapy, my understanding of that is you're injecting in a localized spot um, to stimulate healing. I had that done before with ozone, although I understand it's often done with glucose. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Pro, pro, prolozone therapy, yeah, absolutely. Yes, I had prolozone before. I heard it's often prolotherapies with glucose. Are those the biologics you're talking about? Or are you talking about other stuff as well? I'm sorry? So prolotherapy is the technique, but oh. there are other... Uh, carriers or other products as well. So yeah, the, so I'm wondering what do you use. The yeah. is one is one, but there are other ones. Yeah. yeah so prolotherapy is the technique of the injective technique. The the ozone or the uh, dextrose or the um, there are many injectates. So you can have different fluids use different fluids, and then the the at the advent of um, at, of prolotherapy in the 1930s. Uh, in early 1940s, uh, they they used irritant solutions, additional irritant solutions to stimulate that, uh, to stimulate an inflammatory reaction, which would subsequently subsequently um, uh, create 
a healing reaction or a repairing reaction. So we have to have inflammation prior to repair in our bodies. So that first 48 to 72 hours has to transpire before you really get the stem cells going back to repair and doing, creating the new ligaments, the new cartilage, the new bone, all of the new uh, connective tissue that uh, creates those, um, those areas. So um, that evolved along until about uh, somewhere in the 1980s, I believe they found out with the stem cells, the stimulation of the stem cells and that, and then all of the, the new stem cell technology and, and those things uh, developed. And ultimately, uh, when, I got, when I got involved, uh, I guess uh, very early on, it was, I, was, I was already thinking, well, stem cells and what causes the stem cells to work, and then all of the science, subsequent science on exosomes and the, um, the, uh, the particles that come out of the stem cells have been found to actually activate and control the, the activation of our own endogenous stem cells that do the repair in the body. And ultimately where, where, where that science is going now is the look at the, uh, de the RNA components that are in the exosomes, the, uh, the um, uh, growth factors, the cytokines, all of the little particles that are in there. And there are thousands and thousands of them in these little particles, uh, the micro microvesicles, and that get spewed out in the environment and then activate the cellular environment there to, to begin and control the repair as it's supposed to be without the creation of uh, scar tissue and all of that. So you're actually just rebuilding things like, not like a fetus, but you're rebuilding the things like they're supposed to be in that place. And then additionally, the, the information that's coming out in, uh, in neurodegenerative diseases and many of the autoimmune diseases and these things uh, have been very, very encouraging, not that they're to the point of um, uh, of standard of care. However, uh, I, in my practice, already have patients that are receiving uh, these uh, biological nanoparticles with uh, results in Alzheimer's and uh, rheumatoid arthritis and, um, uh, and uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, strokes, uh, those things there. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so that's what I want to ask you about. I think, you know, I saw arthritis, bone and joint disorders. I think a lot of people are probably aware these days that, you know, stem cells can be used for things like that to, to help, you know, stimulate, uh, help repair and regenerate and all that kind of stuff. And that's all cool. But there's other things you've got listed here, like uh, autism uh, and diabetes, as well as infertility. You just mentioned Parkinson's. So can you tell us how that works like if you're talking about a brain issue are you are you injecting it directly into the brain or is it that you inject it and it goes wherever it needs to go how does that work so so uh, the initial brain studies were done in china and they did do direct injections yeah. uh, um but with with positive results i think uh, uh but that was with uh, primarily with stem cells not necessarily with exosomes and the uh the administration Exosomes, actually, we can, uh, the administration of exosomes is so much easier. We can actually take a, a nasal spray, uh, and as long as it gets up here into the olfactory nerve, the olfactory nerve actually absorbs the, the exosomes, and they track to areas of damage in the brain. In a higher concentration, uh, even though exosomes cross the blood-brain barrier, um, and that can be facilitated or non-facilitated, um, even though they cross the blood-brain barrier, you, you do the nasal and the concentration that uh, results in the brain is uh, 10, 100-fold higher than, uh, than if you do it systemically through a, an intravenous uh, injection. So those uh, are still very early studies and, um, and so either experimental, experimental or investigational at best, but uh, for those people who are who are interested and have the wherewithal to say, okay, well, we know it doesn't cause damage. Um, let's give it a try. I would just say, try, yeah. um, for those people, don't wait until the last minute. It's so yeah. frustrating when people are, they're like, they have waited to the last minute and they're trying to pull an, a Hail Mary to save them. Um, that's, it's really discouraging and, and uh, frustrating. Because there's only so much that even exosomes can do when you have waited until you're, they're about to put the nail in your coffin. 
In an ideal world, you'd meet all of your nutritional needs in the form of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, and more from the foods you eat. However, unless you prepare all of your food at home from scratch using the highest quality ingredients possible, the reality is that most of us need some nutritional support. Most of us need to take supplements if we want to look, feel, and perform at our best on a consistent daily basis. And this is especially true if you have genes that give you an elevated need of certain nutrients. And this is where Feel Younger can help. What I love about Feel Younger is that they offer a huge range of quality supplements and healthcare products formulated and endorsed by Owen Robinson, including must-haves like magnesium glycinate and vitamins B12, D3, and K2. And they do it at affordable prices with free shipping for orders over $50 without ever compromising on quality, purity, or potency. To learn more about how Feel Younger supplements can give your health a boost while supporting this podcast, please visit feelyounger.net and use promo code rejuvenate to get 20% off your first order. That's promo code rejuvenate for 20% off your first order at feelyounger.net. Sorry, I realized we skipped over something. What is an exosome and, and where does it come from? I think people have an idea of stem cells. You know, it used to come from fetuses, fetuses now it's umbilical cord. What is an exosome and where does it come from? So exosomes, every cell produces exosomes. So exosomes are little, they're like little bubbles that contain uh, the chemicals, the uh, DNA, well, it doesn't contain uh, DNA material, but it contains uh, small fragments of RNA that actually manipulate the DNA and uh, of the cells that they're going into. Uh, it has growth factors like um, brain-derived neurotropic factor or, um, or chondroblast growth factor or osteoblast growth factor. All of these growth factors are produced to varying degrees depending on the origin of the, of the exosome. So you have exosomes that are produced, I mean, cancer cells produce exosomes. So you're, you're, um, one of the issues uh, is uh, if, you have, uh, if you have cancer cells in your body, uh, and we haven't, it hasn't been diagnosed yet, uh, if you get a stem cell injection, okay, stem cell, I'm not talking about exosome, but if you get a stem cell, it could be exposed to the exosomes from those cancers and convert that stem cell into a cancer cell. So, so getting if you if you're you know looking at a stem cell therapy, well, those therapies could be potentially onerous if you have an undi undiagnosed cancer in your body and nobody's found it. It could actually aggravate the problem. Or if you have um, have an active cancer, it could aggravate the problem. But Exosomes in and of themselves do not have DNA material in them uh, that is that could change a cell into a cancer cell. So that being said, the 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 main sources of therapeutic exosomes. Well, I guess the main source right now is the um, or the is the umbilical cord and the uh, placenta. Uh, so those are uh, and those are actually much better than getting your own stem cells because your own stem cells are old. They're probably, they, they're risk to, to mutate uh, they, and their metabolic activity is very low. So you, you really don't want your own stem cells, um, but the ones from the umbilical cord uh, of, uh, of live, uh, live healthy childbirths uh, with the consent of the mother and uh, that have been properly screened for, for you know, COVID and the other viruses and, and that type of thing. Um, so as long as it's a, a good product, then, then those have the potential for doing, going to different areas of the body and stimulating repair out from the stem cells that exist in those areas. And that's uh, very often what I use for my joint injections and prolotherapy. Uh, I use that for intravenous. I do use the, the nasal. I have pulmonary fibrosis patients that, um, that I give inhaled treatments to. COPD uh, works. It works very well in COPD. I think the uh, all of these areas have yet to be uh, fully uh, fully investigated and that's why uh, we do have good information on it but um, but again since they're, these are biological particles that are active in the um, in our bodies uh, and they're they're produced by our bodies they can't be patented and so they're, the pharmaceutical industry is only interested in, in those things that it can patent to uh, to get an effect so 
we're you know it's a it's a little bit of a um, an ethical and a, a therapeutic conundrum at this juncture because of that. Um, but I, you know that the pharmaceutical industry is certainly working on some means to enhance those activities uh, potentially. But in my mind, uh, if we if we're uh, if we have them available in large quantities for uh, therapeutic purposes, I, I, stimulating the normal pathways, repair pathways, uh, is a perfectly reasonable approach. And I, I believe it should be investigated further if we have a budget for it. Yeah, and you know, it makes more sense than throwing away the placenta as they used to do or maybe eating it. You're going to get some of the benefits like some cultures you know, have done, but it seems like extracting the most beneficial bits and <laughs> applying them therapeutically like this seems smart to me. Um, and I know you said you're about to, uh, before we start recording, you're about to uh, launch a diabetes uh, program. Is this involving this technology as well, did you say? So uh, let me give uh, just a little clinical background. Do you, do you want? No, go ahead. I can't give a clinical background. Uh, so, so one of the byproducts and one of the first patients I ever put on the optimization program um, was a he's a poor fellow. He's in the book actually, um, and he uh, he had he had really bad diabetes for twenty five plus years. Uh, he's he had bad degenerative arthritis. He had multiple complications of his diabetes, neuropathy, uh, nephropathy, so kidney failure, um, nerve tingling in his nerves, really bad um, results there. He had, um, he had some damage to his retina uh, and he had uh, coronary disease and congestive heart failure. So he had multiple complications of his diabetes and when he came to me, he, his, his internist had retired. And so he came to me as uh, his hematologist at the time and said, well, uh, you know, would you take care of me? You know, I can't seem to find anybody that, you know, I really get along with. And I get along with you. So would you take care of me? I said, sure, but you're going to do what I have to tell you to do, right? And, uh, and ultimately, he was obsessive compulsive, did everything I told him to do. Uh, he, he, and he graphed everything. It was amazing. The guy was uh, amazing, obsessive compulsive. He would graph. I had him do five finger sticks a day um, and all this. Well, I had him off of his insulin, all of his insulin. He was on 120 plus units of insulin a day because um, he was managing it by finger sticks and all of this. Uh, two and a half months, all of his insulin was gone. Um, and then he had five oral medications and it took me another two months or so to get, uh, get him off the last one of those. Uh, but since he was so compliant and did, and he absolutely did everything I told him to, he was off of all of his diabetic medication in the, uh, in four and a half, five months. Now it was a very funny thing that happened at the end of that. I told him, well, maybe don't, don't take the finger sticks five times a day, do it two or three times a day, uh, just to see where things are. He came back two weeks later doing five sticks a day. I said, no, 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 John, don't, don't do that. Just you know, do two a day, one in the morning, one in the evening. He said, okay, came back two weeks later, five times a day, still graphed out on his graphs and everything. And he, he couldn't believe it. He couldn't, the problem was he couldn't let go of that, that he, he was off all of everything and they had been treating him for 25 plus years for diabetes. So that inspired this program. That's where that's uh, and the results I've had since then with multiple other diabetics. That was ten plus years ago. But uh, all the diabetic results in, in the practice. Uh, another guy that had kidney kidney failure, heart disease, um, vascular disease, and neuropathy. Um, he he came in uncontrolled diabetes on about ninety or one hundred and. 100 units of insulin, four or five medications. Um, he had a challenge, though. His wife wouldn't stop feeding him rice. So, so uh, unfortunate, unfortunate guy. But again, six months later, he had, uh, he also got exosome infusions, but he got um, his kidney failure, kidney failure improved by about 30 or 40 percent, which is, got him away from, you know, the dialysis machine. He got, uh, he, his, um, he didn't entirely get off the insulin because of the because of the wife's cooking habits. But oh, come on, at any moment he could have told her no. Yeah, that's true too. But um, that was a tough situation. But and his his quality of life just 
exploded um, almost in a wheelchair and in a few months he was active again going and doing um, and, and, you know I have dozens of stories like this it's just one after another and the results when you optimize that environment um, you know you can add exosomes exosomes actually will increase the the liver's ability to process and increase uh, the insulin sensitivity of cells and improve the uh, uh, beta islet cells uh, in the pancreas to produce a little bit more insulin also and be more bioavailable. All of that, all of those things happen with the with the exosomes, but it, that's a huge expense. If you just do the optimization program, your body's sensitivities go up and uh, and the need for the need for sugars drops and um, you, you get an amazing result. So. Um, this is uh, we're taking these principles and putting it into this course uh, for for everybody. Uh, yeah, yeah, regardless of where you reside. Yeah. So. Ah, oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I was going to say it's been a fantastic conversation, but let's get to the practicalities. We already mentioned your website a little bit earlier, so that's uh, you know yourinfinitehealth.com. That's great. Uh, you also have the Your Infinite Health podcast on all the usual podcast platforms. Is it on YouTube as well? Yes. Yes, and it's on YouTube. Fantastic. Um, so that's great. Now, you know, I'm listening to this. I'm really interested. The book is available to everyone on Amazon, so that's cool. Now, I know you're based in Louisiana. You guys have a kind of system there where you can't treat everyone in the United States. Is that right? Or like, so which states do you guys work with? Well, luckily, you know, COVID opened up, opened up the doors for a lot. So we have patients who live all over. Um, ideally, they come in at least once, especially if they're going to want a regenerative procedure that has to be done on site. Um, but once they're in, they're in, and you know we can uh, we have a virtual practice. Like Zoom usually is what we use for virtual consults, and then we ship the supplements that we have that they need and, and whatnot. So. Fantastic. Oh, so you're allowed to do that because a lot of people I speak to, they're like, oh, I can only work in you know Washington or whatever. Like, so so you can really do it throughout the United States. And you can you can get laboratories at any of the national labs. And... Fantastic. What about outside the United States? I mean, I think fifty percent of our viewers are United States, so we covered a lot of people there. But do you, do you have international people or not really? We have people who tra who have traveled out, you know, on vacation or whatnot, and we've had to ship. I mean, obviously shipping is a disaster when you're trying to ship to another country. Um, and then it does become more Depends complicated. Depends on where. That it was, does. It can be. Um, and also with the time zone. The Bahamas zone. are hard for anybody. <laughs> um, you know, it might be more cumbersome, but if somebody's interested, we'll try to make it work. It's doable. Okay, that's fantastic. So you're really offering it to anyone, um, you know, with the exception of if their customs agents are not going to allow you to ship to them, that's something that you can't control. But otherwise, you do, and then at the time zone issue, they're going to be willing to accommodate when you're awake and working and all that. Uh, <laughs> I've got a client in Australia at the moment, so I'm familiar with that. But uh, yeah, it's... Um, uh, fantastic. So that's really great. Well, I, I think what you guys are doing is fantastic. I'm so glad that there are people out there doing what you're doing and, you know, covering so many of these things and, and helping people in such a uh, genuinely holistic way. I, I just did an episode recently where I said most people who say they're holistic practitioners are not that holistic. You know, they're, they're, they're missing huge aspects of healthcare. Um, and I know you guys even do work on the genetics currently in terms of the, the you know, the methylation of DNA. Uh, I know we're going to talk in the future about maybe how we can add, you know, genetic ins insights potentially and, um, you know, have that be part of it to, to make it, you know, even more holistic as well. Not that you need it, but I think, it, you know, be an interesting value add uh, well, and we'll see. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm one step away from getting my own results, so I'm really excited about, about getting that completed. Excellent. Yeah. So, yeah. But, you know, I think what you guys are doing is really awesome. Um one of the reasons I want to get more people like yourselves on is because I get a lot of people in the comments, you know, like for instance, like the episodes on thyroid or different hormones and stuff like, oh, Ellen, my doctor doesn't do that. Doctors don't do this. It's all very well in theory. So I was like, I want to get a few people on who totally get everything I'm talking about. Maybe they get it more than I do. Like <laughs> they're very advanced in it. Um, and, you know, who are, who are practicing doctors who absolutely are implementing it. And so I think you guys have been a fantastic example of the, all of this rejuvenation, regeneration, holistic, working on all 
all the different facets of someone's health. There are people like you guys out there. I think it's great. Um, I hope people are inspired. At the very least, that there are people like you out there. And then, you know, really, you know, if uh, if they if it works practically and all the rest of it, to inspire to give you guys a go. I think you guys have a uh, you know a fifteen minute discovery call thing. So uh, if you go to the website, you can click book now and you can just speak to someone. Uh, and you know, you can work out. Maybe it'll work for you, maybe it won't, but you know, you can speak to someone and see. Um, I'm interested in uh, you know, calling up and uh, trying those exosomes. That's not something I've tried before. It sounds like I'm gonna have to actually go to Louisiana at least once. So we'll see if I can make yeah. that happen. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, <laughs> and you've got a very interesting podcast as well, where you have lots of you know interesting guests who I guess are again on a similar vibe to you um, in terms of you know having that very holistic approach to health. So I'd recommend checking out that podcast as well. Uh, anything else that you want to plug? I guess I did the plugging for you. Anything else you want to mention before we finish? <laughs> no, you're, you're amazing. You, you did it amazing, all. Right? That was great. I appreciate it. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. So uh, remember to check uh, Lene and Trip out. Um, and thank you for watching. See you next time. Thank you, Alan. Thanks so much. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed that, I recommend watching our latest episode, which you can do by clicking above. And make sure to subscribe, like the video, comment, and share with anyone who you think might appreciate it. Thank you.